Well, we have to adjust. I thought this was the modeling show, so I brought my trench and a nice suit. But this is not the modeling show, so I figured, oh, this has nothing to do with the seminar, so I better take it off. Besides, I would never look as good like Captain Motion looks when he wears his cape. Captain Motion is back there. Round of applause for Captain Motion. Before I began, Captain Motion was the first person that I looked up to when I was a public defender, and that's when I said, oh, I can take on anybody. If he can take, off, take on the DAs, the judges, his own office, I think I can take on a couple of cops. So, Captain, right there. Secondly, I am not as versed, as knowledgeable in the science as other people who do DUIs. My forte is doing DUIs for dummies, meaning I don't know the science so well, so I have to adapt and use what they call street cred. Use practical information to connect to the jury and get them to vote not guilty. What happens is, a lot of times, we're like the weather people. How many of you turn on the weather channel to learn, or the news, to find out if, you know, what the weather's like? And they go, the highs, the lows, the humidity, whatever. I'm like, shut up. Do I need an umbrella or a sweater? That's all I want to know. Okay? You follow me? Okay, listen, my speech was supposed to be five hours. I cut it down to one hour so you guys don't fall asleep. So here we go. All right. Some, and those of you who saw this before, do not, do not say anything. If anybody can guess what these words, these letters mean, you're going to get a free pass machine, Alcosan so four. Okay, I want you to look at it, take a mental note, see if you can figure it out. The first three are pretty easy. I'll give you a hint. Cover your Okay. S. So. Okay, I just want to skip over it. Boom, next. So let's go on. I'm going to ask that again. If anybody can guess it, you'll get a free pass. Machine. Here we have a case, and this is what I mean by doing stuff that most people don't do. Is first of all, you work very hard, but you have to think outside the box. Here we have a case where a DA is passed out behind the wheel and apparently had taken more than just alcohol. The CHP tries to knock, knock on the window, hits the window, attempts to break the window. The defendant wakes up, can't open the door, barely opens the door, stumbles out of the car, and he sounds completely sober. So, get it on here. Certainly, mentally, every. Hey, Josh, it's all right. All right, David. All right, look, I just have to make sure you're okay with drive before I let sure, you go, sure, okay? Sure, sure. He's just here to help me out, and you're not really listening to what I'm asking, all right? I'm certainly listening to everything you're asking. Okay. How much you had to drink today? I haven't. You ever had anything to drink? No, of course I haven't. Okay, then this should be really quick. We'll get you out of, of here. All right? So listen, you, you'll be on the camera if you stand right here on the sidewalk. There's no camera on this side, but... Well, the camera's right there. Okay, I just want you to get hit by the car. The, the audio doesn't play as well as it did my computer, but basically, in the very beginning, you could barely hear him talk. He talked like this, I am, and the camera, whatever. You kind of got the gist of it. So how do you explain something like that? I'm like, wow, how do we do this? So since he was a DA, and supposedly he lied about drinking, he was going to get fired. He was a 35-year veteran DA. So what we did is we came up with the idea of Sleep drunkenness. So, it's not, it's not moving again, not changing. Not changing. Hmm? It's not showing it. Oh boy. Current slide. Okay. 
So, you know, obviously the solution was to bring a waitress, a doctor, wherever, you know, to explain it. We got a psychiatrist who was a sleep disorder specialist and we came up with a sleep drunken defense. And he was a sleep disorder specialist, so we basically said that he was sleep drunk. He woke up and the jury actually believed that. <laughs> Why? Because you get some sand and you throw it in their eyes, they can't see, they can believe a lot of things. The other thing we had, the problem with the cops, how many of you have heard when there's a no driving supposedly, or that they weren't driving um, that recent, is that what? The hood is warm. How do you beat that? How do, how do you attack it? Well, how warm was it, right? Well, it was warm. Then some of the questions that we came up with was, what part of the hood did you touch? What part of the hood is the warmest or the hottest? And by the way, there is a portion, by the way, just so you know, if this is the car, the hood, near the steering wheel, where the windshield is, that is the warmest part of the car. So I learned these questions from being an expert. So how long does it take for the hood to warm up? How long does it take for it to cool off? When you hire an accident reconstructionist, you can get a lot of ideas, and that's what we did. So we actually had the expert drive the car the exact same distance and touch it for three hours every 10 minutes. And what you will learn is this, newer cars that have the paddiness of the hood, if you drive your car in the 80 degree weather and you park it and you touch the hood, guess what? It's gonna be cool, not hot. You let it sit there 50 minutes to half an hour, it'll start to get warmer and warmer and the peak heat is usually about an hour and a half to two hours. This is what I mean by thinking outside the box. Now, let's talk about the RE stuff. This is a point that needs to be driven home. We always compare, basically, a cop, almost like, a, like he's a genius, and juries buy that. And I'm glad that the prior speakers have been talking about the fact that they are not medically trained. And what we do is, we have to attack them at their own game. I have some goodies here, which are basic accordion files. So you can see. You have to do some work. And this is a preliminary hearing. Six days on a manslaughter case. Now, why am I showing you this? Because it's great when the expert gets up there, so-called expert, and you open it up a little bit more. And these can open up to 24 inches. When they get up there and they start testifying and they look at what you have, they start to get a little nervous or very nervous or sometimes poop their pants. They probably don't tell us because sometimes I, you know, I sense something's going on in the courtroom. You have to really, really work hard and the great thing about this is this, whenever you have a, a case that involves the DRE situation, whatever drugs they have, you get a few articles on each of the drugs that, are work, that they're working on. In this case, there were five drugs on board, so I had five folders with articles. Now, how do I find those? Now, I'm not that smart. I don't read science so well. What I always do is I hire Dr. Rose. Raise your hand if you've heard of Dr. Rose. If you haven't, you gotta use him, he is a genius. Whatever drug you have, he will send you one, two, 20 articles. And he's very inexpensive, he spends a lot of time. And when you show him these articles, after one or two hits with his cop, they'll start to get real nervous. Now the 12 step process, I know that you've heard this over and over. I'm gonna just go through them real quick here. I'm not gonna go talk about each one, but I do wanna talk about That one, the last one. It's very simple. I like to say that in opening statement and also bring it up in cross. If the cop does not know what drugs you, your client took, I guarantee you 99% of the time they're not gonna know. You know, I love it when I have cases when the clients actually misstate what they took. Well, I took, uh, yeah, I took some cocaine uh, about 20 minutes ago, whatever, and it was a depressant and the cop sees everything about a stimulant. And then they try to explain their way around that. And then obviously, 
when the opinion is done, they get the actual report, and lo and behold, whatever you told them is what they have. Now, what I like to do is, you've seen all these steps, I like to kind of pop quiz the officer. Even though most of these guys do a lot of DRE testimonies, again, since I'm a practical guy, I like to say, what's step number two or number five? If they get the first two right, then obviously I'm going to move along. But why not just ask them, what's step number five? What's step number nine? Uh, they start looking you know, like they're, they're lost. Then you can make it look like they don't know what they're talking about. These are practical points, OK? The vital sign. So what is the pulse rate? Is the expansion and constriction of an artery generated by the pumping action of the heart. So I like to ask the expert, define what a pulse rate is and see if they get it right. And then, you know, they'll say, see if, it's, if you have your information there. And what is, an, what is an artery? See if they properly define it. What is a vein? Now, most of us know what a vein is, but what if they don't have the proper terminology of each thing? Can you score some points? I do it all the time. Now, the reason that's important is because it's in their own manual. So when they get something wrong or they don't define it properly, I like to bring the DRE manual and show it to them. You follow me? If they don't define it properly, then you want to be able to show them that. Vital signs. How many arteries can you choose from? Many of them will not know. There's different types of arteries. I like to ask you those questions. You see this? You think they're going to know everything? Most of the time, they do not, OK? I like to ask them, why did you choose that artery? That's the way I was taught. Is there a better way? Was there more than one artery? And by the way, if you want to slow down the trial, by the way, it's not in the materials. By the way, if you're looking for the materials, it's not in there. But I'll be happy to share the PowerPoint. I like to show charts. A lot of times when you're in trial and you have to time it so that either your witness is late or you want to drag it out to the end of the day so you can come back and ask more questions, the best way is to show charts and diagrams and go through each part of the whatever chart you have, in this case, the heart. Now, the lack of training problems. I believe, like the other speakers say, you don't want to attack the expert and say that they're dumb or you don't know this, you don't know that. You want to talk about the fact that they didn't properly get trained. And you want to go through each of these little categories just to see how much training they really get. Because they come in as a DRE, and if you want me to back up on any of these things, let me know, OK? Um, I like to point out the fact that usually there's no nurses and certainly no doctors around when they do this so-called evaluation or training even. When they get trained, most of the times there is no professionals or there are no professionals. And basically, it's cops. Cops teaching cops how to do this type of DRE. The procedure attack. Again, what is blood pressure? I like to ask in each category. Systolic pressure. Diastolic pressure. Blood pressure. See if they de de uh, define it properly. Vital signs of blood pressure. And here are the, uh, the averages, OK? Now, a lot of these things, the cop may or may not know. But if they do, if you suspect the cop does know, I like to say it first and then say if they agree so that at least I can pretend like I know the stuff. Now, this is very important. A lot of cross-examination is glossed over on this issue. On pupil size, with this DRE that I did in Fresno, and by the way, I should say, I was going to show you two videos out of the five videos they did. It lasted six days. And by the second day, KBC 30 was there, the radio was there, the newspaper was there, because they couldn't believe that it lasted more than two, three hours. So in the video, it actually shows what I did during the uh, examination. Pupil size is very important. How many of you have these charts, the DRE cards? Yeah, very few. I like to show that to them, and especially when they go, well, that's, if it's a CHP, they go, well, we use the CHP card. Oh, CHP. Oh, we have the International Chiefs of Police. There it is. I carry every one of the cards. 
to cross-examine him and also to show off to the jury that I have done my homework and I have all this stuff. Now what if you say, well, but that's the way they do that. Well, I took it a step further and I ended up buying an electronic caliper. I like to have the cop try and draw the little pupils based on this card of what they think the numbers are and then you can just move the caliper up and down to see if they're accurate and I guarantee you there's not one cop that's going to get it right and even if you try to put the caliper right on the side like 5.0, 6.0 it's so hard you really have to adjust it just right so again little toys wakes people up as far as you know, jurors falling asleep on you when you're talking about such a dry topic, okay? Now, again, when you ask the cop how long they have to wait when they do the darkroom exam, a lot of them don't know, but it's got it's to be at least 90 seconds, okay? And there's your little cards. Now, this is key. We keep hearing about normal ranges, right? The normal range is 5.0 to 6.0 or 5.0 to 6.5 right or 3.2 in a dark room, whatever whatever I want you to be aware just like in a DUI case when they say I will assume post-absorptive remember that I will assume post-absorptive therefore Johnny if I use retrograde meaning go back and figure out the number they will tell you what the number is same thing with pupil right does everybody know what I'm talking about when I say retrograde extrapolation first of all yes well okay just like when you want a cop to say yes you go like this yes 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 Okay. They always say retrograde means they were post-absorptive. If they're outside the normal range, they say, well, he was affected by the drug. But the key point is that there are ranges, not just normal ranges. Room light, the pupil size is 2.5 to 5.0. Normal range is 4.0. But the range is 2.0 to 7.0. Five. Dark light or near darkness, 5.0 to 8.5. Normal range, 6.5. And they always focus on a normal range. The normal range is 6.5 and Johnny's was 8.0 or 4.2, whatever. The range is 2.5 to 9.5. And that's in the DRE manual, and you have a copy of that. Direct light. 2.0 to 4.5 normal range, the average is 3. But 2 to 7.5 is the range. And that's on page 27 of the, of the manual when it talks about pupils. I kind of threw it in to, to guide you, okay? Do you see how important it is to talk about ranges, not just normal ranges? And when you have their own manual, by the way, it's fantastic when they say, well, it's this or that, and you're able to pull out the manual. And I think Michael Kennedy does this. He puts a bunch of little tabs so that the jury knows that you've been reading this stuff, and the DRE knows you've been reading it. So I like to show them. And once you wound them one or two times, you just have to walk towards the table, pretend you're grabbing the manual, and they go, yes, okay, 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 okay. They get it, okay? DRE trials, DUI trials, it's all about telling a story and putting it on a show. I mean, I love the prior speaker who talks about a story. I went to five regional Jerry Spence um, trial uh, college trainings. I went to the ranch. I came back and I did three or four more just to keep my batteries charged and understand how to do this. Because since I'm not a very smart guy about in science and everything, I figured out a way to bring up normal stuff like this to connect to the jury and give them information one, the jury thinks, hey, this guy knows his stuff, even though I really don't know that much. But they, they can connect to stuff like this. Direct light pupil check. It is very important not to position the pin light too closely or too far away, since this will affect the constriction or dilation of the pupil. But also, in addition to that, what kind of light was used? Fluorescent light? How close was it? You could fry the pupil and make it do weird things for not hours, but days. And I have articles that talk about that. I got that from Dr. Rose. I was able to cross them in their DRE with those issues. 
Again, a cop is not an optometrist. He's not an ophthalmologist. Again, the cop did not, did or did not do diagnosis of nystagmus. He did an evaluation of nystagmus, and this is very important. I can't emphasize how important it is to know that they're not diagnosing something, they're looking at something. In order to diagnose something, you need to be a doctor, basically, an optometrist or an ophthalmologist. And again, fatigue or stress can make nystagmus worse. And how many clients are so cool and collected when they get arrested? I've been pulled over six times by the cops. And I wish I could play my recording that I had in my PowerPoint, but I got pulled over by the Harvard PD, and I record myself. I carry a recorder everywhere I go. I recorded myself, and the cop claimed that I was under the influence. I don't drink and drive, period. I'm too petrified. I will be the poster child. But these cops, they just make up stuff. And I haven't recorded when he says, why are you so nervous? And I wasn't really nervous, but why are you so nervous? I said, I'm not nervous. Well, you haven't looked at me. I said, I don't need to look at you. Follow my finger. I said, I'm not going to do that. And then he goes, follow my finger. I said, what are you doing? I'm doing the horizontal gaze nystagmus test. I said, sir, you're doing it too fast. What, you think you're some freaking lawyer? I said, yeah, a DUI lawyer, a board member of CDLA, California DUI Lawyers Association. And he backed away. I said, give me your watch, Commander. I kid you not, a month earlier, I had done a DRE trial with a DRE guy on 20-something nanograms of marijuana. And they're going, Norwich County, we convict with five. I said, well, you should have an easy conviction. Hung jury, 11 to 1 for not guilty. And I love it when the judge said, Judge Bailey, those of you who practice in Norwich County know, people, do you intend to retry this case? Absolutely. He goes, no, you're not. Case is missed. I didn't even have to say anything. So I like it. <laughs> now, the good thing is about this cross-examination by pointing out little things like the pupils and all that stuff, even the speed of the HEN, and I'm not going to get into all the FSTs because most of you already know that. But when I did the HEN, when we were talking about the movement, I kid you not. General question, how long should it take to properly administer an HEN? How many cops really know that? This is what they do. Five, carry that two, plus seven, plus, you know, whatever. They start doing that. I said, no, no, officer, just tell me. Mm, 40? This is the jury. 40? I'm like, 50? 60? Final answer? And he's like, oh. I said, oh, 120, minute and 20, uh, minute and 20 seconds. After going through that, and I said, uh, you are the expert, right? And the jury started laughing. I mean, it's not funny now, but in the heat of the moment, I was scoring so many points, I was wounding them so much that the jury started coming my way. But these are the little things that I do. Anyway, so this guy, I said, give me a watch, Commander. And I wish I could play the recording, but it comes over. Hey, Felipe. I'm like, hey, Brian. That was my DRE who was a sergeant. They brought me the freaking guy that I crossed that, and he's like, Surely, have you been drinking? I go, man, I got a pass machine in my car, which I do, by the way, for all my friends, not for me. In case they're driving, I test them, make sure they don't get DUIs, otherwise they have to hire me, and then they have to sell their house, because I charge so much. <laughs> so anyways, these are joke grenades, people. Eventually, it'll go off, OK? Um, anyways, I was let go, but the guy says, no, follow my finger. I said, I'm not going to follow your finger. Are you going to let me go? If you follow my fingers, I'm not going to follow your finger. All right, Felipe, have a nice day. I said, right, dude, later. I love speaking like that to a cop, being a lawyer. Anyway, so it was just hilarious that this guy didn't know squat. OK, let's talk about nanograms. How many of you hear that if you have you know, 10 nanograms of X and of cocaine or 12 nanograms of marijuana, ooh, you're, you're wasted, right? Now, we've heard over and over, and there's studies that say that nanograms or levels really don't mean impairment, right? You've heard that? Come on, people, you heard that? I was here, I heard it. Yes? Yeah, OK. Play with me, people. Come on, play along. Um, don't be like those terrible jurors that I get, man. They're like, I go, shit, I'm going for a hung jury. I'm just going to stick with one, man. Because the rest are just like, we're ready to vote guilty already. So participate. Anyways, it scares people because in certain counties, like Orange County, if you have marijuana and if it's nine nanograms, what happens? Hey, can you give me at least a wet? Screw you. We convict people on four and five nanograms. Like, what? 
Okay. Nanograms, nanograms, nanograms. And they, I had a case in Malibu before they closed it, a guy had 62 nanograms of active THC delta 9s. They goes, man, that's like a lot of nanograms. I'm like, dude, DA, shut up. I don't care. I'm going to trial. This is what you need to know. It takes a million nanograms to make a milligram. When you get your prescriptions or your Tylenol, what happens? A 500 milligram tablet, whatever, right? And yet we're talking, it takes a million nanograms to make a milligram. By the way, if I suck speaking, at least this will be enough for you to cross examine someone and hopefully get a hung jury. That's it, and I'm done. No, I'm just kidding, shit. I'm not kidding. Uh, that means it takes one billion nanograms to make a gram. See, I like to use these type of words or words uh, or graphics like this so the jury can understand it because if they keep saying 12 nanograms, you're under the influence, uh, 10, 20, 30, how do, you, how do you know that? When I talk about, you know, talking about DUI alcohol, when I talk about absorption and elimination, I don't go absorption, elimination, post-absorptive, and you know, I don't talk like that. I tell the jury, I'm a practical guy. I'm not smart like these scientists, but I know how to break it down, okay? For alcohol, for example, when I talk about absorption, that it overestimates alcohol, I don't say it overestimates. I say, that's like a swimming pool. Anybody in Voidia, I really ask them, anybody have a pool, swimming pool? They go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anybody have any kids who went to college or, or competed swimming? Yes, yes, yes. Or I'll use the word Olympic swimming pool. I say, imagine an Olympic swimming pool. You throw some chlorine in the corner of the pool, and then five minutes later or 10 minutes later, you go check the chlorine levels. It'll be like poison if you check it. That's what happens when you're on the absorptive side. It is way too much. And that's what happens with breath instruments, on and on. Does everybody follow me? Yes? All right. That's what you have to understand. So therefore, then I say when the jets are all over the pool and activated, two hours later, when the, all the chlorine is completed, you can go check it anywhere. Do you follow me? So same thing here with, with a DRE examination. One billion nanograms to make a gram. 500 billion nanograms to make a single pound. 500 billion. And yet they want five billion for the wall. Pooey! I spit at that. And those of you who believe in the wall, I have some boxing gloves outside. All right, here we go. Give them a graphic. Why are we here, ladies and gentlemen? Look at that. A milligram. OK? Sugar. There's your milligram right there. You see that? And it takes a million nanograms to make a milligram. Now you understand? how this can impact the jury on a practical level? Yes? How about the objective science? How many of you have had a DUI where there's no objective science? Really? Fuck. Give me your case, man. I'll try it tomorrow. <laughs> really? Wow, that's incredible. I've, I've never had thousands and thousands of reports. None of them say no objective science. There's always something. They say it means intoxication. I say it just means consumption of something. Okay? Odor of alcohol. Remember, odor of marijuana. It just means they took it. Doesn't mean that you're under the influence. Slurred speech. With my accent, forget about it, man. I'll get arrested every time. I love this stuff. Green coating of the tongue. How many of you who've done weed? I'm sorry. Your friend has done weed. Has ever had a green tongue? Raise your hand. It doesn't happen. How in the hell do they keep sticking with this shit? It's unbelievable to me. Bloodshed, watery eyes. Almost every single DUI, whether drugs or alcohol, there's always bloodshed and watery eyes. Always. Now, there's a the difference when it comes to drugs, by the way, especially marijuana. Ciliary versus bloodshot. 
Ciliary is redness from the pupil going outward. The, bottom, the picture that you see here is bloodshot eyes. You see how all the redness is there? I couldn't find a picture for ciliary that I was able to download, but the actual ciliary redness is like little um, branches of capillaries that branch out from the outer part of the eye here to the white part of the eye. And by the way, I, I have been doing DRE trials for a while. It wasn't until I talked to Dr. Rose and I was breaking down every single little symptom of this kid's symptoms and every drug involved in this case, and that's what I learned. Did, any, did anybody here know about that already? Raise your hand. Yeah. Manny. Manny, one guy, the master of trials. I didn't know it. So you attack the DA expert. Same thing with an alcohol uh, case, okay? I like to exaggerate, actually, by saying that they already knew the opinion when they come to testify. I like to say, when you got in your car, left the crime lab, you already knew what you were going to say. If it's a drug case, he was under, impaired by drugs and under the influence. If it's an alcohol case, under the influence of alcohol and over 0.08. So I like to ask him, how many times have you testified for the defense? And be very careful when they say it, once or twice, because usually that means they testified at DMV, OK? Not in a criminal case. And that crime lab is an agency that operates under the sheriff's department, at least in California. So I like to ask him, so you work for the police? No, I don't. Well, OK. The police agency is your client, correct? Uh, and by the way, the word correct, I try not to use it too much in trial, because you've heard of Terrence McCarthy cross-examination techniques. Don't use correct. Remember that? OK. I think it works 99% of the time. But when you want a yes answer, what do you have to do to a witness? Correct? And I nod and I correct. I had a judge in Downey who said, counsel, stop nodding your head. You're making the officer say yes to everything. I said, what? I said, officer, you mean to tell me if I just nod my head, you're going to say yes? Of course not. <laughs> so you were 20 feet away, right? <laughs> That's what I keep doing, OK? Again, the crime lab many, many times prepares questions for the DA. They have a script. Ask the question. And they say, no, well, OK, you didn't lose any points. These are simple questions. But I'm telling you, and the reason I discovered that many years ago, because they were flipping to the questions, right? And I thought, man, this DA is pretty brilliant. Man, these are some pretty good scientific questions. After five minutes, we went on break. And I overheard him, because I have bionic ears, man. I'm like, I actually read lips, too, so don't talk shit about me, because I can read your lips. I'm just kidding. And I heard him say, oh, did I ask you these questions? What page did you, uh, oh, no, a page was missing. A page missing? Oh, yeah, well, I didn't send you everything? I said, holy shit. I didn't know that they were giving each other scripts, by the way, and I have been doing that for at least five, ten years. So I came back, and I said, well, how many scripts do you give them? How many pages? Well, I don't know, about five. I said, well, didn't you just go over it during the break? Ask those questions. They have freaking script. The A's are not that smart, by the way. Remember, when you do prelims, if you do felonies, or when you're a public defender, you do prelims, which is your first training, you can kind of learn what the script is for the freaking DA. Officer, by whom are you employed by? How, how long have you been employed by? And what agency do you work for? And uh, how many arrests have you done? And then that magical knowledge spews out of the DA. And what happened next? And what happened after that? And the real smart ones go, and then what happened next? Oh, we got an A student right there, man. So anyways, when they're, they're not that smart, so they just basically follow scripts. The DA expert, OK? They will tell you this number means that they use drug within, and this can marijuana one three to five hours. Well, so what do you need to establish as a DA expert? The number doesn't really mean anything. Eventually, the expert will tell you, yeah, yeah, but you know, they try and correlate a number with, like, if it was an alcohol case, and it's not. So whether a person is 50 nanograms or 2 nanograms, the number is insignificant. Remember, someone could be impaired by 0 nanograms, because cops in the studies have seen people that are impaired with 0 nanograms, 0 alcohol, 0 everything, OK? Back to the green tongue. Odor and green tongue. I love it. It's not a bunch of nonsense. 
Again, it only tells you that someone may have smoked or been around someone with marijuana. Obviously, if your test comes back with some nanograms of THC Delta 9, then you know, then you've got to admit that they had some, but that's what they smelled it. Um, again, the fact that you're consuming does not mean that you are under the influence or impaired. Again, I like to say the hygiene stuff, I don't like to break that down too much because it just means your client's a pig. He's got bad hygiene and he's got a green tongue, man. You have to be pretty dirty to get a green tongue, okay, if you don't brush your teeth. Um, here we go. Could be a possible sign that someone consumed marijuana or meth but does not tell us about impairment. You have to repeat that. There's a thing called the trilogy effect. Have you heard about that? That you say the things three times, usually you want to say it in order. For example, if you want someone to remember it's a green car, you say, you stopped the green car driving southbound, yes. And when the green car stopped next to the curb, blah, blah, blah. And then you approach the green car. So obviously remember the one word, green, green, green. You can still say, the tril do the trilogy effect sporadically. You don't have to line it up one after another, OK? Now, this is important. I like to talk, talk about this in any type of seminar that I do. Because a lot of people get caught up in knowing the science, breaking down the science, tearing down the cop, attacking the cop. But I, I was good at that stuff, man. I used to beat up the cop, and my client would be like, man, you're a beast. You're, you're awesome. And then an hour later, guilty. I said, like, what the hell? What happened? Why are they both guilty? I went to the trial college, and I realized, oh, shit, I was just beating up the cop too much. And I didn't understand the jury. So if you want a full detail about the belief system, go on YouTube, type in the name Darren Harding, H-A-R-D-I-N-G, Darren Harding. And if you don't believe that that is one of the best presentations to understand human nature, then God help you. It really helps you understand people, and it helps you understand jurors. Darren Harding, the belief system. He says when he went over this stuff, it was like the Holy Grail. Basically, what he says is that we make choices. Choices dictate our behavior. The, be, the behavior basically creates habits. And then it's compounded over time. OK? And I'll elaborate a little bit more. Our belief system that we were installed with shape our view of how we experience the world. For example, if you're white and you grew up in an old white neighborhood, in a very wealthy neighborhood, are you going to hate the police? Come on, people. No. I guess no one's rich here, right? OK. But if you never had a bad encounter, you're not going to hate the police. And I'm going to tell you some people say, oh my god, why did you leave that African-American juror in there? She's a supporter of MAD. Why would you keep her? Or this Latino guy. He doesn't believe in drinking alcohol. Why would you keep him? You know why I keep him? Anybody? Hmm? Down to earth, good point. Many of them their families Exactly. Many of them or their relatives have experienced or had negative experience with police officers. I don't care how rich this African American is or how rich and wealthy this Latino is, I guarantee you there's at least one relative or close friend of theirs that has been messed with the police. And let me give an example, because I would like to give examples so that you can understand what I'm talking about. I did a trial again in Downey. 0 0.16, 0 0.16 pass with a 0 0.12, 0 0.12 breath. Two hours later, was he rising? No, come on, people. 1.6, two hours later, he's at 1.2. Was he rising? Come on, no, right? No. The guy says, I want to go to trial. This cop is lying. I said, my God, are you kidding me? And then the driving was, he's driving on 710 freeway. I know that you don't know these freeways, but the freeway 710, near Imperial, freeway's closed off, only one lane is open. He blows through all the cones on the other lanes, cuts off a car in the number one lane. The officer says, stop, stop, with his flash, stop. And he accelerates towards the cop. The cop claims he changed flashlights from the right hand to the left hand, hits the hood of the car, and he goes back and he falls, and the partner officer pulls out his gun, and you stop, you mother effort. And he finally stops, okay? Those were the facts. The client says, I didn't do any of that stuff. 
I was driving. I, I went past in the number one lane. My exit was there, and I kind of made a quick right turn and went through my exit, and they pulled me over. Those were the facts. And at that time, there were no videos. I said, dude, I'm a good lawyer. They say I'm a magician, but I'm not God. He's like, I have full faith in you. I said, I just told you, I'm not God. I want to go to trial. We went to trial. And I have to add a little spice to this. It's a funny story. Judge says, by the way, God help her, because she's already dead, but she calls me into, trial, into the chambers. Chambers, why is this case going to trial? The DA is right next to me. That DA is now a judge in El Monte Court, by the way, but it's funny. She just says, why is this kid going to trial? I said, I think my client's innocent. What are your defenses? I said, what? The DA's right here. Get out of my office. I said, well, you asked me to come in. Get out. That's why I got out, and I left. <laughs> then she says, Mr. whatever, if you lose, I'm going to max you out. I said, well, judge, a timeout. I think it's inappropriate for your honor to be already... I don't care. I will max you out, sir. Six months. It was his first DUI. Anyways, so we go to trial, and I did my voir dire, did do everything. I get to my closing argument. I put the charts. The judge is over there. The jury is right here. I get in front of the charts. Can everybody see the charts? I'm adjusting them, and this is what the freaking judge says. Counsel, stop talking to the jury. This is not what here. The jury is ordered not to respond to counsel. And when she's doing this, this, I'm doing this. <laughs> she finishes talking, then I do this. <laughs> jury starts laughing, and these two old white ladies that I was ready to, was ready to kick out earlier, along with my mad supporter, African-American juror that was in there, the two ladies look back over the charts, and they go, counsel, we can see everything just fine. I go, I got a hung jury. I got two right there, man, two jurors on my side. We go to trial, two hours later, not guilty. I'm like, what kind of facts were this jury listening to, man? Not guilty. <laughs> I kid you not. I was shocked as much as my client was. He goes, what? I said, yeah. What do we do now? I said, we run before they change their mind. You know, let's go. <laughs> So what happens, the reason I mention all that is that African-American juror who said, I support mothers against drunk driving, I've been an active member for at least, I think she said 12 or 18 years, however long she's been married. My brother-in-law's an alcoholic, my other brother-in-law's an alcoholic, my father-in-law's an alcoholic, uh, my father was an alcoholic, and I read sing drunk drivers. I said, well, juror number 12, and I had just come back from the Jerry Spence College, and I said, I'm afraid that no matter what the facts are, you're going to believe everything an officer says from that witness stand. And she says very quietly, I'm also black. I, next, I skipped her over. <laughs> the prosecutor had no clue. So two weeks later, I go to the Compton Court, doo -doo, and the judge says, hey, I heard you were da-da-da. I said, yeah, you got not guilty. I said, what? I haven't been in trial. Yeah. My sister was in your trial. I, said, I finally put the name together. I said, holy shit. He goes, you kept her? I said, yeah, she was black. That's why I kept her. And that's my point. You have to understand the human nature. If that woman would have been white and she, was, she attended one AA meeting, she would have been out. But this one was a supporter of Matt, and I kept her. But again, at that point, I didn't understand how that was working out until I listened to this video. And by the way, every this is a commercial slash counseling for you guys, OK? Every morning, what I do is I listen to YouTube, four categories. But the one category that's important for you guys is emotional songs to figure out why is it that a song in two minutes can make you cry or 30 seconds make you cry. I'm trying to crack that code, by the way. I'm on my fourth year. My closing argument techniques told me 14 years. And I wish I would have been talking about closing argument because that's my favorite topic. But anyways, I listen to YouTube videos. And I'm trying to figure out how it is that you can get up in front of a jury and in two minutes, five minutes, get them to cry. I get them to cry, but only in closing argument, and then laugh and cry. But it takes me a week to get to that point, so I'm trying to figure it out. So listen to YouTube videos, find out why one person can sing the same song as 12 other people, and yet one person makes them cry. Why is that? It's the human nature, the experience, right? So, and then I also listen to nutritional videos every single day. This is not accident, accidental, ladies and gentlemen. This is not normal, okay? I will talk about cholesterol, triglycerides, all that stuff later on. 
I can lower your sugar level, lower your cholesterol, you name it. But anyways, I listen to YouTube videos. This is the best one I listen to. The belief system will actually shapes how we feel, what we see, what we hear, what we anticipate, and your ability to relate to people, and your ability to talk to other people. If you don't believe that, listen to the people that dislike Trump, listen to the people that like Trump. Same thing is said about Trump, and one person says, yeah, Trump, and the other one goes, lying piece of garbage. I mean, why? Because their belief system says ah, they'll find the positive thing about that person. And the basic premise of that is this, positive halo, negative halo. You put a positive halo on someone, they can do no wrong. These Trump people put a positive halo on Trump and they can see no wrong. The anti-Trump people put a negative halo, he can do no right. Do we agree? We seen that? Yeah. Let's, talk, let's get back to DRE. But again, I think it's an important component. Don't think that knowing the science and reading those articles and showing all this stuff is going to win. I put all this in front of the table for psychological reasons, psychological warfare before real warfare, okay? And the other thing is you've got to entertain. Now, my famous thing is my use of cars. You've seen me do that, right? Cars, 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 cars. Well, I stepped it up a notch. I moved up to motorcycles. Whenever I have a trial, I order as many motorcycles until I find a matching one. This was for a manslaughter. I ordered 14 motorcycles. I finally got the identical one, okay? So if you have a Beamer, a Cooper, whatever it is, I get the cars and I use them. And I like to, depending on my jury, if it's a conservative white jury, I don't go around and turn on sirens, okay? I don't do that. If it's a black jury, Latino jury, I like to use it and they go, hee hee hee. They, they like it. They go, ah. If I go to Mississippi, I will use this one. And no offense. Mm -hmm. Sorry, huh? Mississippi people. CHP, California, Mississippi. Okay? But anyways, cars, you can entertain people tremendously with cars. So, drug recognition expert. Look at this. Pretty simple, right? Now, why am I mentioning this? Because many times when they do a drug DUI, they don't use a DRE guy, right? Have you had that? Because I've had it. Yes? You want to point out that they have all this stuff. They have DRE people. Every single, single police department has it. And they should call them out to the scene when that happens, and they don't. So there's plenty of cross-examination of these people. Remember earlier when they said there was a medical rule out? Here's a cop saying, okay, medical rule out. Can you imagine you go to a doctor, eh, don't worry, Billy, you don't have cancer. A cop's gonna tell you that? No, no, you're not gonna accept that, okay? Again, there's absolutely no, no research whatsoever that HEN can cause you to drive badly. That's what I like to present. I don't like to say, well, was, there was only two clues or three clues or four clues. I like to basically say, look, AGN, first of all, doesn't measure anything, period. And you have natural nystagmus, and we can go through all that stuff. And look at the very bottom. No scientific literature that correlates pupil size with HEN, blood pressure, body temperature, with driving while impaired on drugs, period. No scientific literature. I don't like to spend too much time on FSTs because what? FSTs don't measure what? Driving. Marceline Burns said, if they measure driving, I would have called them driving sobriety test. Plus, this is the big one, FSTs or SFSTs were not evaluated for drug suspects. It was alcohol, period. If you don't want to spend too much time on FSTs, just cross on that. Challenging the qualifications, you talk about their training, the hours, all the stuff that they you know, go through, the protocol, you know, things like that. You're going to say, why ask all these questions? If you have a bad case, at least this will slow down the conviction, my friends, okay? Just ask the questions, look smart, okay? 
How about the synergistic effects? Well, alcohol and marijuana. If you're a 0.05 and you have alcohol, that means you're really, really bad, right? That's what they say. You're really under the influence. The one plus one equals three theory. That's a bunch of nonsense, okay? They say it makes it worse. So you have to attack the studies. Here we go. Look at this. Marijuana and alcohol and actual driving performance. The 2000 study. The sample size was 18, less than 20 people. Are you kidding me? How many people live in the United States? Millions. They use 18 people. And they said that they drove within 30 minutes. Well, most people took it and drove way after, so that doesn't even apply, okay? Another study here. The interaction again, alcohol and, and the marijuana. This one, six people. And yet the expert will say, well, the study of Ray Hicks said blah, blah, blah. When you break it down like that, it's not so big of a study, is it? Six people. Think about it. Speech. By the way, in California, well, those of you who have recordings, remember, there's a 90% chance that the CHP audio or the police audio is not going to have any slurred speech. I like to ask some questions at DMV that lead them to say or to think that I want to say how slurred he is, that he had mumble speech, slurred speech, blah, and I pound it, pound it, pound it, pound it, and then in trial, I use the audio or the video and, and I clobber him, okay? The other simple way to say it is basically you understood what he was telling you, right? What is slurred speech? And this is very interesting. One person said, and a, and a cop in my trial said, well, they were so slurred, they were like they're dropping gum, like, like spinning a gum, like drooling a gum. I said, really? What? Drooling like what? Drooling a gum. I said, you know, like, like this? <sighs> no, like drooling. I said, well, like, phew. And I went on and on, and the jury was laughing. So I like to, you know, call them out on their game. Again, this is practical information. Bloodshed, watery eyes, we already talked about that, allergies. And this is the most important part of red eyes, by the way, right here, in the middle. Have you heard of the white eye flight? How many minutes? I like to ask the officer, officer, red shot or bloodshot, watery eyes? Have you heard of the white eye flight? What? I said, but there is a what? There is a what? Red eye flight. There's a reason why they call it the red eye flight. Why? Because it's in the middle of the night. And Johnny usually, or, or Jane, usually get arrested at midnight, one, two, three in the morning. That's why they have bloodshot or red watery eyes. That's why they don't call the red eye flight the white eye flight, okay? So here we go again. Anybody guess it? Cover your ass. And, and by the way, before you say that, let me go back. One of the things that I've done, and I, I'm going to give you some free advice on this, if you have a serious case, don't try it alone. I've been trying cases now with Don Bartell. He brings me on his cases. I bring him on my cases. We've done five huge felony trials. And again, I wish my other stuff worked. I was going to show you the videos of that. We've been able to win cases with paralysis and Pomona. Those of you who know Pomona, neck down with a video of seven shots and six beers, blah, blah, blah. The stress level just is tremendously reduced, and you can certainly work a lot more if you put your ego in check. Five trials, five not guilties, including reductions in trials, okay? So here we go. Back again. Cover your ass so you won't be reported to a state bar. Bingo. Next. Close! It was DUI case. Not damn, but anyways, you're a winner. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right, we just have a couple of another announcements, but Felipe, Felipe, fantastic presentation on behalf of the National College for DUI Defense. Thank, Thank you. you very much for being part of our faculty. Let's hear it for Felipe.